online. Please welcome to our first panel. It's called Presenting the Challenges Facing Achieving Zero Hunger. I'm sure you must be already a little bit tired of seeing me the whole day, so this is what we have, the Deputy Director of Communications, Yasmina, together with me. Yasmina, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as we heard this morning already, we have less than 12 years to achieve zero hunger. And of course, we've also heard that there are a number of obstacles in our way. Um, but we also know that we're here to try and overcome them in the numerous ways that we can, because every one of our actions matters, and they're all interconnected. Today's morning panel is about the challenges, but not only the challenges, they have to come with solutions. And as Enrique said, we have a number of uh, distinguished uh, guests in countries who wanted to share with uh, their experiences with us. So I get to be um, the bad cop in this particular case. <laughs> we will ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes, four, minutes maybe, <laughs> um, so that we can have a dynamic discussion. Uh, just for all of you to know, the interventions will be from the floor, from your seats as well. It's a bit difficult to do a 1,000 person round table, so we will be the ones turning around you for the round table. So thank you very much, now that we know the parameters. Before we start, and before we go back to touch on the challenges, be they malnutrition as we heard today, this morning, be they conflict, climate change and variabilities, and poverty, um, we must all understand that we have our role to play. I'd like to share with you this FAO video, which was done in collaboration with acclaimed actor, French actor Lambert Wilson, who has volunteered of his time. He's a director, actor, and activist, volunteered for the cause of zero hunger. Of a drought, another famine. This is nothing new. Millions of people are on the verge of starvation. Does anybody care anymore? Sometimes it seems like nothing more than another distant headline competing for our attention. This is not a headline. This is real life. In a few years, there'll be 10 billion people on the planet. How many of us will go hungry then? One food crisis after another, the number of hungry people across our planet on the rise. And the causes? Droughts, floods, but also our wars, our conflict and violence. This makes no sense. We are causing it. So what kind of future is waiting for us? You could almost say famine and hunger are man-made. But if this is true, could we also be the ones to change things? We have one food future, or no future at all. If we don't change things, who will? There's enough food for everyone. We need to respect our food, the people who grow it and the people who don't have enough. Imagine a future in which every person on Earth could have nourishing food every day. A future where leaving home could be a choice. And where all farmers could sow seeds for a better, sustainable future. What if everyone had the power to secure that future today? There is only one future. We have the power to choose what it looks like. No matter who we are or where we are, we all want the same thing. Our actions are our future. A zero hunger world is possible if we work together. So indeed, our actions are our future. And you'll be happy to know that this video is also in several different languages and is showing uh, freely on TV, uh, many televisions, French, English, Spanish, Italian, and Arabic. So um, others will know as well that every action counts. I'd like to turn myself now to uh, Madame Josefa Sacco, Commissioner for the African Union. In this somewhat seemingly at times daunting uh, challenge, um, how do you see uh, this affecting Africa and reaching zero hunger by 2025, as Africa has said that they hope will reach before 2030? So we really look forward to that. Um, and we saw in this video as well a dialogue between different generations. Does youth and youth employment, does that become part of the solution? Mrs. Sacco. Thank you, moderator. 
Excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Allow me first of all to congratulate EFEU for organizing this uh, important ceremony that we are all here. And I would like to also commend all your, your presence in this uh, 2018, the World Food Day. I would also like to commend also EFEU for the team, which is our action. Our, our feature. Uh, this team is really very significant for the African continent because the African head of states and the government, they call for zero anger by 2025, uh, even five years before the Agenda 2030 uh, SDG, uh, which is uh, ending anger by uh, uh, 2030. We are we we anticipated our our vision, you know, in ending anger in 2025 because we are more vulnerable on the continent, and uh, you know we need to speed up and uh, save our our citizens in, on the continent. So we we know that if a country like Brazil and uh, China could do it, we believe that Africa can do it as well if we have a strong political will, a commitment to really address uh, uh, this uh, and in anger. We also know that uh, we made progress in this decade. You know, early this decade, there was a lot of progress made by uh, African in terms of uh, secure food security. But in the later stage, you know, since uh, uh, 2014, we started having again food insecurity, and uh, we need to really, you know, we need to really speed up and, uh, you know, conquer our our position that we, you know, our good uh, progress that we made at the el uh, earlier uh, years of uh, these decades. Uh, we in Africa, we are really uh, very much uh, worried about this situation, the recent situation of food insecurity and malnutrition on the continent. So we had the, the privilege to assess our countries on the continent uh, by our biannual review report that we submitted in January to our head of state to adopt. And w with that, we you know we try to see their progress in terms of the Malabu commitment. And the commitment number three of the Malabu, it is ending anger by 2025. But when we look at uh, 47 reports that we receive out of 55 countries on the continent, we realize that uh, we are not on track. We are not really on track. The documents are there. It is evidence-based. So we need to really you know, make more effort and commit ourselves to end anger if we want to achieve the goal of 2025 set by our, our, our leaders on the continent. We also, uh, uh, we also organized some uh, high-level meeting in January. Uh, we had a side event with FAO, we organized with FAO. We had this side event that uh, we tried to do more advocacy about the importance of addressing the issue of food safety. Uh, you asked me about the youth. Of course, uh, you know, we want to engage the youth. We had uh, the first, uh, we organized with FAO and the government of uh, uh, Rwanda, the first uh, uh, forum on the, how to engage the youth in uh, agriculture. And uh, we believe that the, the youth is the active labor force that we need to invest on them and uh, create you know, a conducive environment for us to embark on the agribusiness model because the, we don't want uh, uh, agriculture to be done, you know, uh, uh, the way it was done, a traditional way. We want agriculture, what we learned in uh, Kigali, to be sexy. So we, let's make agriculture sexy through the new innovation, <laughs> technology, and profitable to our use and for everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Sacco, for your words. We all know that the European Union is one of the most important development actors in food, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. We are pleased to have with us the Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development of the European Union, Nevin Misa, here with us today again. Commissioner, could you tell us how the European Union deals with all these challenges? Please. Yes, thank you. Your Majesty, Director General, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, dear colleagues. So, we've all heard the diagnosis. 
Global hunger is rising again after decades of decline. Too many people going to bed hungry. Too many countries on the brink of famine, largely due to ongoing conflict, climate change, and instability. Hunger is one of the most vicious and visible signs of vulnerability, the hard edge of poverty and insecurity. It hits those left the furthest behind the first, women and children. If we don't act now, we risk reversing our hard-won gains and missing our goal of zero hunger. Today's World Food Day is an urgent call for action to get back on track to 2030, to a world where every new and unborn child gets the right start in life, where women prosper from equal access to agriculture, assets, markets, and decisions, and where we all benefit from happy, healthy, and inclusive societies. Malnutrition costs the global economy $3.5 trillion a year, and untold more in opportunities lost. But every dollar or euro spent on nutrition brings a return of 16 times or more. So the incentives are clear. What are we waiting for? The European Union always has and will champion decent nutrition for all. It's in our DNA. We know what it means to feed a continent devastated by conflict. Today, we are working with over 40 partner countries which have prioritized food and nutrition security. And we have committed 3.5 billion euros until 2020 to combat undernutrition. Our spending in this area increased threefold between 2014 and 2016. And as a result, the proportion of stunted children is declining. But we know that more is needed. We also recognize the growing challenge of overweight, obesity, and related non-communicable diseases. We are addressing this so-called double burden of malnutrition through policy dialogue with the countries concerned, in coordination with our European and global partners. We have been working with international actors through the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, Sun Movement, to mobilize all relevant sectors to improve nutrition. In 2016, we launched the Global Network Against Food Crisis with the Food and Agriculture Organization and World Food Program. This has strengthened our shared analysis and actions, especially through the Global Report. For example, we provided immediate and long-term relief to the countries hit by El Nino in 2016 and averted famine in four countries last year. And last month in New York, we increased our support to the global network by another 70 million euros. I have always argued that empowering women is one of our smartest investments not just because they are the backbone of uh, many rural areas, but because they are powerful agents for change, for families, communities, and economies. We are therefore stepping up our support for the three Rome-based agencies work to transform the lives of rural women and girls. A new action will contribute to food and nutrition security by addressing the root causes of gender inequalities and triggering transformative processes that empower women in their households, communities, and societies. When we talk about smart solutions, we also need more innovative partnerships. That's why I'm delighted that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation joined our efforts with some of our member states to tackle another major challenge to food security, climate change. Together, we pledged around 600 million euros to the ZERA initiative to boost development smart innovation through agriculture research, capacity building, and more public and private partnership and investment. 
This year, for example, we will work on improving pest sur surveillance, moder modernizing breed and seed systems, and building the next generation of scientific leaders in Africa. Engaging the private sector in order to promote and facilitate sustainable private investments will be crucial to achieving zero hunger. Through our external investment plan, we have already agreed to provide 250 million euros of guarantees and blended finance to trigger several times more investment in innovative agriculture. Finally, let me also say a word about conflict and the vicious circle cycle it creates with food insecurity, because no country can be at peace or prosper without decent nutrition. The global network against food crisis, which has now expanded to 11 organizations, seeks precisely to strengthen the links between our humanitarian development and peace actions. The 70 million euros we agreed in New York will improve global dialogue, coordination and responses to food crisis of the relevant actors in these three areas. During my visit to Colombia last year with the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, we witnessed firsthand how important sustainable agriculture and rural communities are for lasting peace, and vice versa. Since 2000, much of our 500 million euros of support for Colombia's peace process has focused on the rural areas disproportionately affected by conflict. We also heard now our joint support had helped to rebuild lives after severe flooding in the Canal del Dica region and to improve longer-term food security and resilience. All of these examples show how complex and connected the route to zero hunger is. But history has also shown that our most ambitious aspirations are often forged from our greatest challenges. We are together today to recapture that leadership and vision, because we dare to imagine a world free from hunger by 2030, and because we know that our actions today will determine our future peace and prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners, with an S. <laughs> uh, we've heard from the both of you about how to make uh, agriculture um, attractive to people, to youth. We've also heard about nutrition. We've also heard about the fact that women and youth should both be empowered. And as you know, Enrique, who's, um, it is not enough just to feed the world. We heard that in the morning as well. We must transform food systems so that we can nourish people. This is what you, you were both talking about. And I'd like to share with you another video here so that we can see really from uh, the perspective of those who benefit from such programs. It takes place in Guatemala, and it's about a food uh, school feeding uh, initiative which actually sources from local farmers and local families for nutritious foods for schools. We can play the video. It's Dulce Maria. Dulce Maria is benefiting from the nutritious meals now served at her school in Guatemala. Nearly half of the children under five suffer from chronic malnutrition. To improve diets, FAO is working with the government and local communities to produce school meals using healthy, locally sourced ingredients. Desde que ha cambiado la alimentación en la escuela, pues se siente mejor. Ahora son más eh, variadas, eh, más nutritivas y eh, más deliciosas. Y se he sentido un cambio en nuestra alimentación. Thank you. That was Dulce Maria from Guatemala. And I'm going to allow myself to move across the stage to move to Thailand. Um, and we know that Thailand has made significant progress in meeting the global targets uh, for nutrition and therefore, in that regard, reducing stunting in young children. I'd like to turn to the Minister of Agriculture of Thailand, Mr. Grisada uh, Bunrach. So, 
Sir, if you would kindly explain to us uh, in a few minutes what the main policies and strategies are that have allowed your country to scale up and to reach the success that it has. Uh, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to speak in Thai and we have an interpreter. ท่านผู้มีเกียรติที่ครบทุกท่านครับกับผมมีความยินดีเป็นอย่างยิ่งที่ได้เข้าร่วมเฉลิมฉลองวันอาหารโลกปี <coughs> ราชสุดาสยามบรมราชกุมารีในฐานะทูตพิเศษด้านอาหารในโรงเรียนของวันอาหารโลกปี <coughs> และปรัชญาสวมหาไทยก่อนที่จะมาดํารงตําแหน่งรัฐมนตรีว่าการกระทรวงเกษตรนั้นทําให้ผมได้ตระหนักถึงว่าการพัฒนาที่ยั่งย
รบัตรัฐบาลไทยอย่างแน่นอนนําเอาพระราโชบายของสมเด็จพระเจ้าอยู่หัวรัชกาลที่10ในการพัฒนาคุณภาพชีวิตของเกษตรกรให้มีความมั่นคงขจัดความยากจนความเดือดร้อนของพี่น้องประชาชนในภาคเกษตรสุดท้ายนี้ผมขอเรียนย้ําว่าการขจัดความอดอยากหิวโหยและการแก้ไขปัญหาภาวะทางโภชนาการนั้นเป็นปัญหาของทุกคนที่ต้องอาศัยความร่วมมือจากทุกภาคส่วนไม่ว่าจะเป็นภาครัฐภาคเอกชนภาคประชาสังคมที่ต้องทํางานร่วมกันเริ่มต้นจากจุดเล็กๆที่บ้านในระดับชุมชนระดับประเทศเพื่อนําไปสู่ความเปลี่ยนแปลงและความสําเร็จในระดับโลกตามเป้าหมายแห่งการพัฒนาที่ยั่งยืนตลอดไป Thank you very much. Minister, let me now share with you a chart. Let's have the chart on the screen, please. As uh, FAO Director General mentioned this morning, uh, we have a big challenge with obesity. Can I have the chart of obesity, please? Thank you. These are the rates of obesity in the last decades. As you can see from here, it has only grown and grown, and the projection in most of the countries around the world where developed or developing countries are increasing. As we have here this morning from different speakers, this is a major challenge for us. Let's talk about nutrition, and I'm going to turn to the Minister of Lesotho, because Lesotho is doing, uh, implementing very impressive uh, policies in the area of nutrition, especially in relation to early childhood development. Minister, could you tell us I think you have to open your microphone. Thank you. We heard already from the king this morning, but mm -hmm. it would be good to hear from you. Your Majesties, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the question is on the linkages between nutrition and health in early childhood development. The Ministry of Health in Lesotho, through its strategically located healthcare facilities across the country, has put in place both nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive interventions. The main focus in early childhood development is on the first 1,000 days of life. And this period includes pregnancy and two years after birth. This is a very critical period when the organs of the body develop, particularly the brain. So nutrition is integrated into the maternal and child health care programs, which are provided in all health care settings within the country. When we look at the antenatal care, which is also a very critical time during pregnancy, mothers are also encouraged to have nourishing diets. They are also provided with micronutrients supplements. For example, they are given folic acid. We all know that folic acid is very important in preventing uh, spinal cord and brain defects in utero. They are also given uh, iron tablets to prevent iron deficiency anemia. Another important uh, strategy is on breastfeeding. As we know that we in Africa, food is still a big problem. We encourage lactating mothers to breastfeed. And this is usually initiated immediately after birth. And so far we have seen in the demographic health survey of 2014-15 that about 65% of women initiate immediate breastfeeding. We encourage mothers to breastfeed for a period of six months after birth. 
But amongst Basutu, it is common that breastfeeding can go up to two years. The benefits of breastfeeding cannot be overemphasized. For example, we know that breast milk contains antibodies that protects the child from early infections. For working mothers, we encourage them to express breast, breast milk so that the milk can be given to the child while they are away at work. We also encourage hygienic practices and good storage of that milk to avoid contamination. Children or, fans, or infants are given uh, vitamins, for example, vitamin E. They are also given fortified food to improve their immunity and their nutritional status. We also do the growth monitoring within all these health facilities. Anthropometric assessments or the measurements are done and growth assessments are conducted in all the health facilities. And we know that these include weight per age, height per age, and weight per height, including the arm circumference. These are the measurements that are used in all these health facilities. All these are used to monitor nutritional status and prevent chronic and acute malnutrition. We also have a program on treatment and management of malnutrition. When children are found to be malnourished at these facilities, they are usually referred to a nutritionist who will interview and provide nutrition advice. For severe malnutrition, such as marasmus and kwashioko, children are usually admitted and treated. We also have nutrition sensitive programs such as child immunizations. We know that children are often exposed to infections such as polio, tetanus, and measles or rubella. And these are provided in all the facilities in Lesotho. Another nutrition sensitive intervention is on water, sanitation, and hygiene. Mothers are encouraged to use safe water to prepare meals for children. And boiling is one of the strategies that ensures the safe water. Management of waste and proper disposal of harmful waste to prevent infection. We also encourage hygienic practices in preparing children's food. These include, it may, be, it may be seen as one of the least things, but it's one of the most important strategies we can use, hand washing. Hand washing is so important because it prevents infection. So we encourage mothers to wash hands after using the toilet, wash hands before preparing the meals. Other programs, because health cannot do this alone, other stakeholders in improving nutrition in early childhood is the Minister of Agriculture and Food Security. And this ministry is mandated to ensure national and household food security, specifically on nutrition issues. The ministry provides community nutrition education and specific emphasis is made to all women and child of, women of childbearing age, pregnant and lactating mothers. The, the program also includes promotion of nutrition sensitive farming and use of biofortified bean seed is currently being promoted, and a booklet on different recipes has been just launched. In conclusion, His Majesty's government, not because he is here, 
His Majesty's Government has a high commitment in implementing this roadmap and have a strong belief that the zero hunger is possible by 2030, and Lesotho will, uh, will as well achieve its vision of a healthy society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard about uh, the various practices in place to, to give women the opportunity of providing nutritious food to their children. And we're very happy to have His Majesty here to push forward as well uh, this topic and also to be our, uh, our goodwill ambassador uh, for nutrition. Um, and of course, we've heard about education for women, which is key education, be it for children, for girls, and education for women. Uh, FAO firmly believes in supporting women as agents of change for rural development. I want to share with you another video, um, and this story comes from Senegal. The lady is Guile. She and thousands of other women have had their lives changed by a new method of harvesting water. It's part of the FAO One Million Cisterns for the Sahel. So if we watch the video of Gile in Senegal. The Sahel region faces severe drought and desertification. Often, women have to walk 10 kilometers for water. FAO's One Million Sisters for the Sahel project helps women and farmers harvest and store rainwater. The cisterns provide clean water for drinking and growing food to millions of people in arid areas. Gile and her family help build the cistern in her village. She and other women can grow vegetables for the first time during the dry season. Money earned from selling vegetables is put in a fund to help families in need. <laughs> So that was, that was Gile. And as we see an example of how to address water scarcity, I'd like to turn my attention to the Minister of State for Food and Security of the United Arab Emirates, Ms. Maryam Al-Mheri. Um, لو سمحتي بأسهل بالإنجليزية. Okay. <laughs> the UAE's rapid uh, economic development coupled uh, with increased population obviously puts pressure on the water demand uh, in the country. If you might uh, share with us how the UAE is preparing to combine uh, this increased demand with its resources and maybe we could ask you to touch on this really interesting initiative of the Silicon Valley for Food Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmina. Uh, Your Majesty, uh, Honorable Ministers, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about actions, so let me talk about the actions the UAE has taken. So the UAE has made food security a national priority, with the minister, myself, here with you today, responsible for the file of future food security. Now, there's a reason why we've named it future food security. Our wise leadership wants us to be proactive and to be prepared for what lies ahead. We are a country with limited arable land, limited freshwater sources, and we are very dependent on food imports. Currently, the UAE imports 90% of its food, which has huge impacts on our eating habits and consumption patterns. And so for us to be prepared and to ensure that we are not only food secure today, but also food secure in the future, we have no other choice but to innovate and to build partnerships and change our behavior when it comes to food. So there are three things we must do. We must plan, we must adopt and adapt technology, and we must advance R&D in our environment. So what are our, some of our actions? We are developing a, a whole of country future food security strategy, which will also define the milestones needed for, from the UAE to support SDG number two. We have launched the AgTech and AquaTech accelerator programs. The aim is 
that in 100 days we remove the existing barriers to promote closed system farming to uh, produce more clean, affordable local food sustainably. This will be transforming the food systems to nourish people in um, arid regions. And it will be a platform where we actually attract the youth, our future, I call them agri-technologists, and also women to start in the food production scene. We are developing also a, a national label to distinguish sustainably grown products that are considered clean products from others in order to educate and drive demand to more nutritious and sustainable products, giving consumers a tool to make better choices. What are we doing to change consumption patterns? We will be um, developing also the UAE national uh, nutritional standards. We will be implementing a food label so that consumers have a, a tool to make better choices when, when buying their foods. What about our children? There is a, a lot that has been done in previous years, regulations, conditions, etc. But we need to understand what actually resonates with the children in order for them to change their behavior when it comes to food. We are a country that imports a lot of food, so the children are not exposed to agriculture as, as we know today. So we need to find other ways, innovative ways, to get them to change the way they understand food and respect food. Also, not forgetting all the humanitarian um, efforts that the UAE has embarked on uh, to actually supply food and health supplies to those countries in need. Also, the UAE has set up uh, food banks around the country to try and reduce food loss and food waste across the supply chain. Uh, these food banks are actually growing in numbers, uh, and so they started with one or two branches. We're now at five to six branches in the last year and a half. So there are great efforts to actually take the excess fresh foods from hotels, restaurants, malls, and distribute these to those in, in need. Now going back to the Food Valley. So the Food Valley initiative is something like the Silicon Valley of San Francisco. As a minister, we must be the designers of the future. And so I envision how the UAE can become a hub of knowledge and technology for food systems in hot, arid environments, which we can then proliferate to other countries with similar challenges. How can we produce food using the things that we have, the sun, the sand, and the seawater? I call them the three S's. Therefore, we will create this food valley to become a platform and network. It will become a database for R&D and food-related subjects, including research papers, uh, contacts, information, um, ongoing projects, finance sources, and so much more. And so I welcome all countries to work with us, research with us, and we need to develop these partnerships and share knowledge, which is crucial for our actions today to support a zero hunger world by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Shukran. Thank you, Minister, for this very interesting initiative. And let's change a little bit the subject. Uh, climate change has been all the time uh, during uh, today. Let me share with you a graphic, an animated graphic that we have on how the, uh, the average uh, uh, temperature in Earth has changed in the last years. Can we have the, uh, the animation, please? This is in the last centuries how the average temperature is changing in our planet. For all, all of for if somebody still has any doubts about uh, climate change. Jasmina. Yes, uh, we can witness uh, that uh, extreme and erratic weather conditions uh, affect a number of areas. And one of the places where it does affect is in the Sahel region. And it doesn't only affect the area, but it aggravates a humanitarian situation uh, in place. We all know that we have to strengthen um, the resilience of vulnerable populations and find new ways to address this challenge. I want to, in turn, now share a slide with you of, on a positive note, 
we got the, the sad note, but there's always something that can change. So the initiative that we see here, as we had heard from the UAE minister, the, diff, the new initiatives, things that we can do to go forward. The Great Green Wall Initiative, which you see here, has the potential of changing millions of lives of people in the Sahel. What its aim is, is to restore 100 million hectares, I'm reading to make sure that I'm not messing up in my math, but it says 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. So this hopefully will also be a way to address the situation in the Sahel, which is addressing what both commissioners had said earlier, find new and innovative ways, find different ways. The Great Green Wall is a very good example of that. With this in mind, because we're in the Sahel, je me permets de me tourner vers uh, Son Excellence uh, Jacob Wadraugo, uh, Minister of, um, of Agriculture for Burkina Faso, who actually uh, will be reading for, for us uh, a message from the President of Burkina Faso, His Excellency Roche-Marc Christian Caboret. Et je pense, I allow me to interpreters to switch to French, uh, je pense que son message doit adresser sûrement cette, uh, cette problématique du Sahel, de ce qu'est-ce que l'on peut faire pour arriver à et atteindre un monde libéré de la faim. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Merci. Avant tout propos, je voudrais dire merci au directeur général de la FAO de nous inviter à cette grande rencontre parce que c'est le président du FASO lui-même qui devait être là, qui devait livrer son message. Malheureusement, il n'a pas pu faire le déplacement pour des contraintes de dernière minute. Alors, nous sommes venus pour le représenter et nous disons grandement merci. Il faut se dire que cette Ce message spécial sera mis en ligne par la FAO qui puisse permettre à tout le monde de pouvoir le consulter. Mais par rapport à la question qui m'a été posée, il faut se dire que vous vous souvenez très bien qu'en 2016, la FAO et le système des Nations Unies ont proclamé l'année internationale des légumineuses. Et cette année internationale des légumineuses nous a permis de croire en quelque chose de croire que les légumineuses ont une capacité de pouvoir intervenir dans la lutte contre la faim et la malnutrition. Nous avons souhaité abriter la clôture de l'année internationale des légumineuses les 10 et 11 février 2017, ce qui a été fait et nous avons reçu Madame Semedo, directrice générale adjointe à cette grande rencontre, Et après, le Burkina Faso a organisé elle-même une journée nationale des légumineuses. Bien entendu que jusque-là, nous n'avons pas pu euh, avoir, euh, la par la déclaration de Ouagadougou, la journée mondiale des légumineuses, mais ce dossier est en cours au niveau du, euh, de, de, de l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies à New York. Et je pense que d'ici la fin des travaux, cette journée mondiale des légumineuses pourront être proclamées. Alors, qu'est-ce que le Burkina fait pour lutter contre la faim et la malnutrition dans notre pays Nous avons fait une option forte. Et cette option forte, le président l'a mis dans son programme de développement de notre pays, le Plan national de développement économique et social, quand il a placé l'agriculture au centre même du développement social et économique de notre pays. Et il a mis les légumineuses à une place qui permette à ce que nous puissions travailler et avoir des résultats pour contribuer favorablement à la lutte contre la faim dans notre pays. Nous avons cru, nous avons fait, nous avons vu. Nous avons cru, c'est pour cela que nous avons souhaité abriter l'année internationale des légumineuses pour montrer qu'au Burkina Faso, on a un penchant sérieux sur des questions fondamentales pour lutter contre et la faim et la malnutrition. Pourquoi les légumineuses Les légumineuses, parce que vous savez bien que euh, les produits légumineux ont des qualités essentielles pour la nutrition, 
ils ont des protéines en un nombre suffisant, quantité suffisante. Ils ont euh, aussi euh, des, des, des comment dirais-je Ils ont euh, des, 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 des sels minéraux. Ils ont aussi euh, une capacité, euh, quantité de vitamines qui permettent à ce qu'on puisse résoudre un temps soit peu le problème nutritionnel. Alors c'est pour cela que quand nous avons cru qu'il y a cette possibilité, nous avons essayé d'organiser le monde rural. Le monde rural, et nous avons fait en sorte que tous les aménagements dans lesquels on peut produire, on puisse mettre une part euh, suffisante pour le, euh, la production des légumineuses. Et nous avons mis 15% des terres pour produire rien que des légumineuses. Nous avons fait en sorte que tous ceux qui produisent les légumineuses puissent avoir un soutien en matériel puissent avoir un soutien en semences de qualité, puissent avoir un soutien en matière d'encadrement. Et en 2016, nous avons produit 735 000 tonnes de légumineuses, ce qui était quand même une première. Et justement, en tirant les statistiques que euh, le directeur général de la FAO a données, justement à notre journée nationale des légumineuses à Ouagadougou, il disait que le Burkina Faso vient en troisième position des producteurs de légumineuses au niveau mondial. C'est quand même quelque chose. Alors, dans cette année, nous attendons plus de 1,5 million de tonnes de production. Dieu merci, la saison est très bonne et nous pensons que nous pouvons résoudre ce problème des légumineuses et faire en sorte que nous puissions le mettre dans l'alimentation de tout le monde. L'alimentation de tout le monde veut dire quoi Les cantines scolaires pour résoudre le problème de nutrition au niveau des enfants. Et vous savez bien que les légumineuses ont cette potentialité à faire un peu, euh, donner un peu de force aux femmes qui sont enceintes, à donner une certaine nutrition euh, qui permette à l'enfant de croître et de manière normale et qui permette aussi aux, aux vieux de se maintenir euh, pendant longtemps. Alors donc, nous avons opté pour cette politique et nous sommes en train aujourd'hui de faire en sorte que ce que nous avons constaté par le passé, parce que euh, nous avons travaillé beaucoup dans ce domaine avec la recherche scientifique, avec euh, et les producteurs eux-mêmes, avec le secteur privé, avec les ONG qui interviennent dans le financement des, des, des légumineuses, mais aussi avec les partenaires techniques et financiers. Nous avons eu des résultats. Alors nous nous sommes dit, pour ces résultats, il faut qu'on puisse les partager. Parce que pour arriver à éradiquer la faim en 2030, il faut impliquer tout le monde. Et nous, dans la sous-région, notre pays est dans le SILS, le comité inter-état de lutte contre la sécheresse dans le Sahel. Nous sommes dans l'UMOA, nous sommes dans la CDAO, le WAP. Et nous travaillons en sorte maintenant que toutes ces institutions puissent se donner la main afin que nous puissions trouver une solution définitive et dans la sous-région, dans la lutte contre la faim, et notre président est le président en exercice du SILS pour le mandat actuel. Alors voilà ce que nous faisons, impliquer tout le monde et que nous puissions aller très loin dans le travail et que nous puissions se donner, nous donner mutuellement la main. Nous avons voulu quand même faire cela parce que vous savez bien que les légumineuses aussi ont une capacité de restaurer le sol. Et cette capacité nous permet justement d'économiser en intrants. Cette capacité nous permet de faire des rotations euh, entre les légumineuses et les céréales. Et ça fait en sorte que euh, tous ces résultats capitalisés, nous devons aller vers une solution euh, de tous et que nous voulons partager avec euh, tous les pays qui sont membres de, de la FAO et faire en sorte que ces résultats puissent apporter un changement et que nous puissions vraiment éradiquer la faim et la malnutrition dans nos pays. Nous croyons, nous faisons, nous voyons et les résultats sont très positifs et nous pensons qu'ensemble nous pouvons faire des changements positifs pour nos populations rurales et pour l'amélioration des conditions de vie de ces populations. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le ministre.
Évidemment, nous ne pensons pas que des toutes petites choses comme les toutes petites légumineuses peuvent vraiment transformer toute une société et re, euh, faire marche arrière euh, sur la faim. Et donc, it really means, even though pulses are very, very small, with a very small thing, you can really turn the clock back and bring back a zero hunger world. Thank you, Jasmina. Uh, allow me to change language. Cambiamos continente, cambiamos de idioma, dejamos Burkina Faso y África y nos vamos a América Latina y a Guatemala. Guatemala es uno de los países, como sabemos, con mayor riesgo del denominado corredor seco centroamericano. La FAO, en coordinación con su gobierno, está poniendo en práctica un programa para fortalecer la capacidad de gestión de riesgo de las autoridades locales y nacionales. Quisiera preguntarle a don Juan Carlos Carias Estrada, secretario de Seguridad Alimentaria y Nutricional, sobre el tema. En, en, en concreto, ¿qué medidas está tomando Guatemala para evitar la migración por la necesidad y lograr la seguridad alimentaria y nutricional sobre las áreas vulnerables? Un saludo a... A todos, Su Majestad Letsi III del Soto, eh, Director General de FAO, FIDA y PMA, muchas gracias, excelencias. Eh, agradecimiento especial a FAO por la invitación que nos hizo a este, a este comité, así como las intervenciones que ha hecho eh, nuestro país de Guatemala, en mucha relación muy buena y adherido a la institucionalidad pública. Eh, no les voy a hablar de estadísticas globales de las cuales ya todos tienen por memoria, ya todos saben, todos dominan, sino que les voy a hablar de lo que sucede en Guatemala y qué es lo que hemos logrado y a qué es lo que le estamos apuntando. En Guatemala tenemos una alta población de guatemaltecos que se encuentra eficientemente alimentado y nutridos. Esto limita su futuro y reduce sus opciones de desarrollo siendo nuestro principal problema la de nutrición crónica en niños menores de 5 años. Estamos hablando de un 46.5%, es decir, uno de cada dos niños eh, tienen desnutrición crónica en nuestro país. Nadie puede tener paz si tiene hambre, nadie puede tener buena salud si se alimenta mal. Por lo tanto, nadie deja su país y su casa si tiene las condiciones satisfactorias mínimas para vivir. El cambio climático la pobreza, la degradación de los recursos naturales, la carencia de agua disminuye esta posibilidad de poder tener una vida digna, sobre todo para la población indígena y no indígena que vive en el área rural del país y que es más vulnerable. La migración es un fenómeno natural en la humanidad, desde la naturaleza de la concepción misma, las personas migran, viajan, se aventuran, pero cabe cuestionarse cuál es la motivación para hacer esto. Sin embargo, el hambre, la pobreza no deberían de ser estas razones. Según Miguel Barreto, el director regional del PMA para Latinoamérica y el Caribe, la inestabilidad socioeconómica, la presión demográfica y la inseguridad alimentaria se han identificado como un disparador de la migración. Estamos de acuerdo con esta apreciación, pues la falta de empleos alternativos a la agricultura y a la reducción internacional de los precios de mercado de los productos agrícolas que exportamos ha disminuido. Precipitaciones pluviales desde 2014 aumentan la migración irregular, especialmente para el país de Estados Unidos. Guatemala sufre estas consecuencias del cambio climático, que se traducen en saquillas, precipitaciones torrenciales en algunos momentos, deslaves, huracanes, temblores y violentas erupciones volcánicas, lo que reduce severamente nuestros niveles de crecimiento y productividad para contrarrestar el fenómeno migratorio de nuestros connacionales, pues arriesgan sus vidas y la de sus hogares con la esperanza de encontrar un trabajo y proveer una mejor realidad y heredar un mejor futuro. Estamos trabajando en planes de resiliencia basados en la agricultura familiar y vínculos socioeconómicos con la ayuda de la cooperación internacional y organizaciones especializadas de las Naciones Unidas como lo es FAO, a quien agradecemos públicamente el apoyo técnico brindado, sobre todo en la formulación de algunos aspectos legales como la ley de alimentación escolar que favorece la seguridad alimentaria en, en los niños del primer nivel de educación. Aunado a esto, eh, la ley de agricultura familiar que se está exponiendo en el Congreso de la República para ser conocida y aprobada. Los insumos para la alimentación escolar, eh, según esta ley, deben de ser adquiridos por los proveedores locales en un no menos de 50% de lo que se consuma. Esto dinamiza la economía local y territorial y fortalece la gobernanza desde la localidad, que es donde suceden estos problemas. 
Guatemala fue el primer país de Latinoamérica en aprobar una ley de seguridad alimentaria. Esto desde el 2004 con la política de seguridad alimentaria, que es una política de Estado, no es una política de gobierno, y la ley de seguridad alimentaria, que es un mandato legal para todos los funcionarios involucrados en el tema y en el entorno que, para proveer seguridad alimentaria a, nuestro, a nuestra población. Este sistema de seguridad alimentaria incluye 14 instituciones gubernamentales, las que tras un mandato de implementarla y velar por su cumplimiento, da vida al Consejo Nacional de Seguridad Alimentaria, que es presidido por el vicepresidente de la República. Se asigna un coordinador, que es la Secretaría de Seguridad Alimentaria y Nutricional de la Presidencia, para tener el espacio de diálogo y el vínculo interrelacionado que a veces en los países hace falta, el abordaje interinstitucional e integral. La sociedad civil organizada y el sector empresarial tienen voz y voto dentro de este Consejo Nacional como parte íntegra de la población y de la sociedad misma. Estos, esto, esto mismo se replica a nivel departamental y a nivel municipal con consejos, con comisiones municipales y con comisiones departamentales para promover la descentralización en la toma de decisión, en la formulación de planes y en la, en la consecución misma de los objetivos. La nutrición crónica eh, es un problema tan grande que el gobierno de nuestro presidente ha implementado una estrategia que es la estrategia para la prevención de la nutrición crónica. Esta estrategia para nosotros vincula y formula todos los actores, los indicadores y los financiamientos que estas acciones necesitan. No podemos pretender establecer políticas, establecer ideas, establecer soluciones si a eso no le asignamos un presupuesto, un norte geográfico, una ubicación geográfica y los responsables y actores de la misma. Para esto tenemos diversos temas de financiamiento, eh, agua, saneamiento, salud, educación, eh, que tenemos que reforzar. Podemos eh, tener los elementos más nutritivos para consumir, pero si el agua que consumimos es contaminada, de poco servirá. La calidad de vida, la, la salud misma depende en gran parte de la calidad de los alimentos que, que consumamos. Todos tenemos claro entonces cuál es la realidad de nuestro país, algunos con temas de desnutrición, algunos con temas de obesidad, pero al final considero que cada país puede proponer las soluciones eh, para esta problemática. Estas soluciones que tienen que dar respuesta a los problemas y las amenazas en seguridad nutricional, seguridad alimentaria y nutricional, y también todos estamos claros que estos planes pueden ser afrontados en conjunto planes que no siempre tienen el financiamiento, que no siempre tienen la realidad, el impacto real que nosotros necesitamos y que lamentablemente en muchos lugares se quedan en proyectos pilotos. En nuestro país la carga tributaria está alrededor del 10%, por lo tanto es complicado poder financiar una atención estatal para la población. Eh, sin embargo, tienen otras eh, secuelas eh, que debemos considerar. Consideramos a percepción propia que este CSA pueda coyuvar realmente la seguridad alimentaria y se puede fortalecer desde un ámbito y una perspectiva diferente. Y para que nadie se quede atrás, como lo plantean los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, se considera oportuna una de las intervenciones que hacía la representante de Emiratos, Emiratos Árabes Unidos en poder poder conocer los proyectos y los planes de otros lugares, poder conocer las experiencias, las tecnologías que se aplican. Pues resultado de esto, se ha implementado un proyecto en Guatemala de producción de alimentos bombeado eh, con un sistema solar. En lugares donde no hay energía eléctrica se ha implementado este sistema y esto ha sido eh, pues las experiencias que han sido compartidas de otros países. Así que tomamos la palabra de Emiratos Árabes Unidos para poder conversar respecto a alguna relación. Esto eh, reduce, significa, podría reducir significativamente la migración, pero más que eso, la realidad de los niños, la realidad de esas sonrisas que ingenuamente eh, transmiten un lenguaje de felicidad, pues tal vez no tienen la percepción misma de su futuro. Pero nosotros que estamos acá para pensar y para plasmar esas soluciones somos los responsables de todo ello. Nosotros decidimos cuáles son nuestras acciones y qué futuro queremos al final. Finalizando con esto. Eh, al señor director eh, de, de FAO, de PMA y de FIDA, pues les hacemos una cordial invitación para que puedan visitar nuestro país.
Eh, en Guatemala tenemos muchos proyectos con FAO, muchos proyectos con las mujeres indígenas eh, en nuestros lugares y que en conjunto han podido eh, sacar adelante estas situaciones. Para nosotros implementar todas las políticas y las leyes es un mandato, una obligatoriedad, pero sobre todo tiene que ser una satisfacción eh, muy propia y personal. Quiero finalizar con un mensaje que ha sido plasmado en la política de seguridad alimentaria desde el año 2004, y es en la medida que todos estemos conscientes de que el hambre y la desnutrición no son problemas solamente de quienes sufren, sino de toda la sociedad en su conjunto, y trabajemos unidos para erradicar estos males sociales, nos acercaremos al fin que todos perseguimos, tener un hogar más próspero, justo y con más oportunidades. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señor Carías Estrada, de Guatemala. We take advantage, uh, we are going to, we just hear about migration in Latin America. In the meantime, I take the opportunity to mention that the president of Poland is joining us for the last part of the, of the high-level event, and he will be talking later uh, after we finish. We continue with the program. Welcome to the president of Poland. We, are, we continue with the program. Ladies and gentlemen, let's wait one second so that everybody sits, and then we continue. Again, Señor Carías Estrada, espero pronunciarlo bien. Muchas gracias por la presentación sobre Venezuela. Ladies and gentlemen, we just hear about migration in Latin America, which is influenced by many factors, including climate change. Another important driver of migration that we cannot forget to mention today is conflict. As many of you, or, or you uh, know, you can see the picture here. FAO established the Nobel Peace Laureates Alliance for Food Security and Peace in 2016 to underline how we, can achieve food, we cannot achieve food security without peace. Aprovecho para saludar a uno de nuestros premios Nobel que está con nosotros, Adolfo Pérez Esquivel. Es un placer tenerlo aquí. El señor Pérez Esquivel participará esta tarde en el segundo High Level Event. Uh, Mr. Pérez Esquivel will be participating later in, in, in the afternoon in the second High Level Event. As I mentioned, we have already in, in, in our screen, we have a few, but we are already 11. We have 11 uh, peace laureates uh, with us uh, working, supporting FAO's work. And we are honored to count on their support. Jasmina. Yes, you're, excuse me, you're, you're right, Enrique. We've heard, uh, without peace, we stand no chance in ending hunger. They are intricately linked. Um, and today I'd like to share once again a, a video with you, which is really a testament about how we cannot achieve zero hunger without peace. In this video, we're going to see a Syrian refugee, Yunus, who's receiving agricultural training in his host country by FAO, other partners, as well as the host country itself. So we can launch the video. There's over 3.5 million refugees from war-torn Syria. Most are in the border region. Yunus was once a finance director for a textile company. He knew nothing about agriculture when he arrived in Turkey. He is one of 900 Syrian refugees and locals receiving agricultural training from FAO, the UN refugee agency UNHCR, as well as the Turkish government. استفادت أنا مو ما استفادت بالنسبة إن يعني حتى لما نعرفونا إنه نحن عم نشتغل بالمنظمة اشتغلنا بمنظمة فاو سوينا دورة كذا وشافونا إنه شلون عم نشتغل على الأراضي صاروا رغبوا إنه يأخذونا. We have seen today how host countries are implementing successful programs to integrate refugees in their communities. Uganda's experience with refugees is another great example. In fact, on a recent visit to a refugee settlement in Uganda, FAO Director General commended the country's refugee model. 
FAO is preparing a documentary on what, about this experience. Let me share with you some images, because really the work being done in, in Uganda with the refugees, it's uh, impressive. Uganda is a small country, but manages to host over 1.4 million refugees from neighboring countries. This is a very important model. Let's see a few seconds of the footage that we are preparing for this documentary showing the world how Uganda is different. <laughs> about the Ugandan experience we have with us, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources of Uganda, Mr. Pius Wakadi. Could you please tell us about this impressive experience? Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The question to Uganda is, Uganda is a small country with a low GDP. What is the motivation for hosting such a big number of refugees? Mr. Chairman, the question should be, what is motivating refugees to come to Uganda? The theme for World Food Day is our action, our future. This theme resonates well with Uganda. As a country, we have a long-standing tradition of hosting refugees. We are a country with a small GDP, but our biggest asset is our people, the heart of Ugandans. Uganda welcomes everyone with a warm heart, respect, and dignity. Uganda has a long tradition of hosting refugees. Uganda hosted Europe, European refugees soon after the World War II. These included the Polish, Italians, Germans, and many others. In 1955, many Sudanese and Rwandese were hosted in Uganda, and currently, most of the leaders in Rwanda were raised and educated in Uganda. Uganda is currently leading the refugee hosting countries in Africa with over 1.4 million refugees. These refugees come from DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, and many other countries. The unique location of Uganda in the heart of Africa and the Great Lakes region makes it ideal converging and center for refugees. Since 1986, government ushered in peace and guaranteed security, which has also been conducive for our visitors. The country's open policy to refugees is welcoming to everyone. It is our policy to contribute towards alleviating of human suffering. It's for this reason that refugees in Uganda are offered land to grow their own food, provided with access to educate their children along with other children in the host communities, permitted to work for those who qualify, integrated them in host communities. It's for the above reasons that the UNHCR says Uganda is the most favorable hosting environment in the world. However, we need to focus more on why we have refugees in the first place. We must condemn forces of instability in our region and beyond that give rise to the phenomenon of refugees. Every human being is born free and deserves to live free with peace and hope. Refugees do not come to Uganda voluntarily. They come because they are running away from conflict, from death, and from untold magnitude of suffering. We must work together to create peace in conflict-ridden areas. Conflict in our region is simply out of greed by forces we all know. Hunger, nutrition, refugees are inseparable. And one of the biggest ways to solve this challenge, particularly in the Great Lakes region, is to deal with the factors that give rise to refugees. We thank the UN, FAO, World Food Programme, UNHCR, and all international and local actors that support Uganda in this refugee situation. I thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Minister. Indeed, you said it. Our actions are our future. And as a host uh, country, Uganda and every other host country gives people a future. So thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I might just do a little switch so that we can get to other kinds of solutions to reach zero hunger. And as we know, and we've heard already from the, the UAE, uh, innovation. We're not going to always reinvent the wheel, but it would be really nice to reinvent or invent new ways of doing things which can actually help us reach zero hunger. So I very quickly turn to the Philippines, uh, where we can see that innovation, uh, particularly tools, drones, are helping support and uh, um, face various issues like climate variability. So a quick look at the Philippines, please. The Philippines is often struck by extreme weather events. Farmers are worst affected as their crops are destroyed and their livelihoods threatened. Lowell is trained by FAO to use drones to collect data on the damage caused. And this means reaching farmers faster and helping them more effectively. This drone program changed our work because it reduces our time in validation and it produces real-time and accurate information. And I'm very happy I have the opportunity to help our farmers to improve their productivity on how to recover from calamities, such like that. So indeed, innovation is wonderful and innovation also requires great investment. I will turn now to the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries of Oman, uh, Wazir Fouad uh, bin Jafar al Sajwani. Kaman, law samaht, asal bil Inglisi. Mr. Minister, what, in your opinion, is needed to put in place an upscaling of the private sector investment in agriculture? Do you yourself have lessons learned which you could impart with us? Thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much. Shukran jazeel and sayyidat wa sada wa al-anisat. Al-atafiq al-yom jami'an ala anna intaj akta al-ghidha asbaha amr ghayr tarafi wa innama dhurura mulaha li tawfir al-ta'am al-mujtama'atina wa kithayka al-jiyah wa lil-alam wa al-ikasatiya ala amn wa istiqrar al-duwal. لكنها أيضاً فرص اقتصادية واعدة وتعزز فرص العمل وتحقق أمن غذائي تحوطي من المخاطر أياً كانت حروب، نزاعات، ظروف مناخية، أمراض وأوبئة أشرت يوم أمس في كلمتي أن بلادي سلطانة عمان تحقق متوسط نمو سنوي يقدر ب 20% خلال السنوات الثلاثة الماضية وربما تشاركون الرأي بأن هذه نسبة هي عالية ونتوقع تسارع سنوي لنسب النمو الغذائي للفترة القادمة حتى 2023 كيف استطعنا تحقيق هذه النتائج؟ استطعنا تحقيقها من خلال عدة خطوات الأولى هي التزام ودعم كامل من أعلى مستويات القرار السياسي وهو أمر مهم لتسريع الخطوات الإجرائية والبيروقراطية وتخصيص الموارد وتهجيج الإعلام الثاني هو الاطمئنان والوثوق بالأطر القانونية والاستثمارية والقضائية وفعاليتها هذه مهمة كثير للمستثمرين ثلاثة تحرير كامل لتجارة المواد الغذائية والموضوع الرابع هو تهيئة البناخ وأدوات الاستثمار والحوافز للمستثمرين وهنا أنقل لكم صورة سلطنة عمان كان الوضع الحقيقة مختلف خلال السنوات الماضية عزوف تام عن من الشباب العماني نساء ورجالا للاستثمار في هذا القطاع أو حتى العمل في هذا القطاع ودخول المستثمرين في هذه القطاعات كانت مستويات الاكتفاء الغذائي دون مستوى الطموح كانت تمثل حوالي ثلث من احتياجات عمان في سنة 2011 اليوم وصلنا إلى 56% وهي مستمرة بالزيادة والحمد لله ماذا عملنا في عمان حتى نستطيع أن نعجل من خطوات النمو في قطاع الغذاء عملنا بما يسمى ببرنامج تنفيذ ديليفري جمعنا فيها في مختبرات جميع الستيك هولدرز أصحاب القرار 
من منتجين من مستثمرين من مصارف من حكومة من برلمانيين مؤسسات المجتمع المدني من الجمعيات الأكاديميين ممثلي البلديات والإعلام وغيرهم وجلسوا في هذه المختبرات والمطابخ فقط ليفكروا بالفرص الاستثمارية الموجودة في السلطنة وكانت النتائج مدهشة كيف يستطيع أن يفكر القطاع الخاص خارج المنظومة الحكومية وأيضا تحدثوا عن متطلبات لتحقيق ونجاح هذه الأفكار وأيضا تشخيص التحديات وكيفية معالجتها وضعت برامج زمنية للتنفيذ ووضع فريق للمتابعة متابعة التنفيذ مرتبطة بأعلى سلطة سياسية وبالتالي تذهب نتائج وفعاليات وأداء هذا القطاع حتى يتم متابعتنا بشكل يومي كمثال من قطاع الثروة السمكية في السلطنة من برامج تنفيذ دليفري وضعنا برامج زيادة الانتاج السمكي من المصائد الطبيعية والاستزراع السمكي إلى أربعة أضعاف خلال خمس سنوات لتصل إلى من 280 ألف طن إلى حوالي مليون و300 ألف طن في سنة 2023 الجميل في هذه العملية أن الحكومة لن تستثمر أكثر من 7% من مجموع يحتاج هذه الخطوات والمبادرات نتكلم عن 93% من الأموال ستأتي من القطاع الخاص وهو توجه جديد في السلطنة كان المعتاد أن الحكومة تصف على هذه المشروعات لكن تغيرت الصورة تماما اليوم اليوم نجري فقط من مختبر القطاع السمكي لهذه الفترة الزمنية لتنفيذ 91 مبادرة ومشروع في قطاع الثروة السمكية لوحدها تم الاتفاق عليها في مختبرات الثروة السمكية الموضوع الثاني قمنا بتأسيس فريق للاستثمار في الوزارة يجتمع كل خميس صباحا برئاستي نبحث عن هذه الفرص الاستثمارية المختلفة نبحث عن المستثمرين نطرح مشروعات جدوى نعمل مع المستثمرين لتنفيذ هذه المشروعات والحمد لله أثبت هذا الفريق فعاليته في استقطاب الكثير من المبادرات والمشروعات بالنسبة للمشروعات التي كان يتردد القطاع الخاص في تنفيذها لأسباب مختلفة قمنا كحكومة بإنشاء شركات بنسب مساهمة تقدر ب 20% ودعونا شركات القطاع الخاص الاستثمار فيها هي مرحلة مؤقتة إلى أن تقف هذه الشركات على أرجلها ثم يتم بيع حصص الحكومة للقطاع الخاص هناك طبعا حوافز للشباب العماني من خلال تخصيص أراضي لهم سواء كان للاستزراع السمكي أو للزراعة وتقديم قروض ميسرة مع توفير فرص تدريب وحاضنات يعني لتوفير تدريب الكافي الفني والإداري والتسويقي لهم هناك برنامج أيضا لإشراك فعال المرأة الريفية في برامج مختلفة لهذه الوزارة وأصبحت المرأة شريكة في الإنتاج تغطي حاجة المناطق التي تعمل فيها وأيضا قمنا بدعم هذه الشركات الصغيرة والمؤسسات والمدارات الصغيرة من خلال الشركات الكبيرة من خلال برامج تعاقدية لشراء هذه المنتجات وبالتالي نضمن يعني مستويات جودة عالية وسوق متوفرة وبالتالي تستطيع هذه الشركات والمؤسسات من العمل وتحقيق النجاحات هذه لمحة سريعة في الحقيقة لما استطاعنا أن نحققها في سلطنة عمان وأعتقد أنه يعني نأمل إن شاء الله خلال السنوات الخمسة القادمة سنصل إلى مستويات اكتفاء أعلى بكثير من الأرقام التي ذكرت وشكرا شكرا سيد مزير Shukran, Oman. Thank you, Minister. We are approaching the end of the session this morning. We have two more speakers this morning. We have Finland and then Poland to close. And let me introduce the, the, the question to Finland. Because among the challenges related to climate change and the increase of temperatures, there are transboundary animal and plant diseases, which affect human and animal health and ultimately food security. I would like to ask my next question to Dr. Dr. Jana Usulu Kalio, Permanent Secretary of Finland, how this issue can be tackled. You have the floor. Your Majesty, uh, Mr. President, ministers, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, 
First of all, I want to thank for the question. And the reason why I say so is that uh, to be able to get the target for zero hunger by 2030, we need a large uh, group of different kind of expertise. So this is not just for a human health side. This also needs experts, even from the area of animal and uh, plant health uh, side. And as we have seen uh, during the past few years and also during the past few months and weeks, uh, animal diseases or plant uh, pests, they do not respect borders. Uh, so it's obvious that international cooperation and regional co cooperation is needed. And therefore, what I want to emphasize is that the starting point has to be sharing of information in a transparent way. Sharing information is, of course, the duty of all of us in the room, the member countries, with the coordination by the United Nations organizations, the OIE, FAO, IPPC, and their regional offices. And in our view, this transparency of information increases the trust between the countries. It increases the trust between the continents on the measures carried out to combat the infectious animal and plant di diseases. And indeed, the challenge of the climate change uh, taken into account with the risk of even new emerging diseases and alien species. So here, as well as in the previous discussions, together we are definitely stronger. So what I call upon is international increased cooperation between the veterinarians, between the plant health and other experts globally, especially to work with prevention, because prevention is always the most effective and the cheapest way to combat both animal and plant health diseases. I also want uh, to inform the audience that Finland has made a proposal on UN level to celebrate the year 2020 as an international year for plant health. And this has a clear linkage to food security uh, globally. And my last point is that we need internationally approved standards where the UN organizations play a crucial role. We have to base these based on, uh, these have to be based on scientific knowledge. So we need international cooperation on scientific level to be able to see the emerging uh, diseases and then to implement them accordingly. That is the duty for all of us. Thank you for this possibility. Thank you. Thank you to the Permanent Secretary of Finland. And ladies and gentlemen, to close this morning, as you know, this year COP24 will be chaired by Poland. And it is my pleasure to invite the President of Poland, Andrzej Duda, to take the floor. Thank you. Your Majesty, Mr. Director General, Commissioners, Excellences, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Food and Agriculture Organization on their 73rd anniversary and express my sincere thanks for organizing today's important event marking the World Food Day. I'm very proud that Poland is among 34 nations that were the signatures to the original document establishing FAO at its first conference in Quebec City back in 1945. To every poll, October 16 is a very special date because of one more reason. It was exactly 40 years ago that Karol Wojtyła was elected Pope John Paul II. The Holy Father had very close relations with FAO throughout his long pontificate. In his message to the 31st FAO conference in 2001, he stated, 
Many of the world's injustice transform the earth into a desert. The most disturbing of them all is the hunger that millions of people suffer with its inevitable repercussions on the problems of peace among nations. Being currently a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, Poland adopts the notion that the ongoing fight of the international community to eradicate hunger is one of the conditions of the world peace. In my remarks today, as asked by the organizers, I would like to concentrate, however, on the upcoming 24th UN Climate Change Conference scheduled for the beginning of December in Katowice, Poland. I'm sure that in this room there is no doubt that protecting of our natural environment is part and parcel of achieving the zero hunger goal that FAO is so actively working on. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland will chair the climate negotiation for the fourth time. This time, our presidency comes at the crucial stage of the Paris Agreement implementation process. Our main ambition during COP24 will be the adoption of Katowice Protocol, a package of decisions, a rule book, so to speak, ensuring that the Paris Agreement moves closer to its full implementation. On the 3rd of December, I will convene the leaders' summit so that the world leaders can gather and send a positive signal to our negotiators that their works on the implementation of the Paris Agreement must proceed efficiently and with a sense of urgency. Finalizing them in Katowice is our top priority. That is why I would like to reiterate my warmest invitation to all parties to the Convention. We count on your presence and determination to adopt necessary decision during COP24. Ladies and gentlemen, alongside actions aimed at achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, the implementation of the Paris Agreement is to ensure the development of low-carbon, climate-resilient economies in countries around the globe. According to SDGs, climate actions should take into account all elements of our environment, atmosphere, geosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. Such a holistic approach will contribute to, to securing sustainable energy supply to households and industries, but also to combating poverty, granting access to drinking water, and ultimately the elimination of famine. Therefore, I would like to underline the special rules of the synergy effect between the following three conventions on climate, UNFCCC, on biodiversity, UNCBD, and on combating desert desertification, UNCCD. It is of utmost importance to undertake joint actions in the fields of soil degradation and climate neutrality, at the same time working towards effective adaptation to climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the requirements of the Paris Agreement is to balance the emission of carbon dioxide with its uh, absorption by ecosystems. We need to stop the CO2 emissions from growing, stabilize their levels, and eventually reduce the concentration of the gas in the atmosphere. To achieve climate neutrality, understood as a state of balance between anthropogenic greenhouse gases emissions and their absorption by ecosystems, we have to increase the capacity of terrest terrestrial ecosystem to absorb CO2 and decrease the level of greenhouse gases that escape into the atmosphere due to poor practices on soil management, management or deforestation. Forests play a particularly important role not only in carbon capture and storage, 
Equally significant is their role in the regulation of water and soil conditions, reducing wind erosion, limiting and stopping the surface flow of fertile soil to the seas or dim diminishing the destructive effect of natural disasters. Reasonable forest management allows us to counter the negative effect of climate change, including drought and soil degradation, and to increase biodiversity in a given area. Forests have a significant and positive impact on drought prevention and soil degradation, at the same time improving and, in many cases, creating favorable conditions for cultivation. This, in turn, can be effectively used by the agricultural sector for food, for food production. As President of Poland, it makes me particularly happy that our state forest, national forest holding, which oversees about 7.5 million hectares, or almost 80% of all forests in Poland, has been doing a marvelous job in terms of implementing and managing small retention projects. In fact, in 1913, State Forest received the prestigious Sultan Kibbons Prize for Environmental Preservation, acknowledging their outstanding contributions in the management and preservation of the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move closer and closer to COP24 in Katowice, I would like to emphasize that we should always put people at the center of our deliberations. Katowice itself is a very good example of a city and a region where just transition is proving successful, where efforts to bring about a more sustainable future are accompanied by standing steady economic growth and increasing welfare of local people. I hope that an, an outcome of our deliberations in Katowice will be a declaration of solidarity, the idea so close to all Poles, leading to more just transition. Through the implementation of bold policies in the area of climate, biodiversity biodiversity and fighting with desertification, we will make sure that the world we live for future generations is safer and more sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. This is coming out to the end. Thank you for all the participants. But before we close, I would like to share with you an image, if we can have this image. This is the evolution of hunger, the reduction of hunger. We have 12 years left to 2030. As you can see here, despite the advances that we had at the beginning of the century in the last three years, the numbers are very dangerous. We have 12 years, we still believe in FAO that we can reach 2030. As FAO Director General says, there is only one number for hunger, it's zero. I would like you to keep this in mind because policies, we know how to do it, and the, if we apply the right policies, we can reach our goal. With this, I'm going to say goodbye, Jasmina. Thank yes, you. we would like to remind everybody that our actions are our future. And to get to zero, every single one of our actions must count. Zero hunger is possible by 2030. We just must all act together. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you this afternoon at the second round table. Thank you.